now where I'm less interested in conveying information as I've been doing for eight years. I'm more interested in trying to make sense of it all, trying to uh, join the dots. Not so much by listening to some authority or other, or reading an article or even a scientific paper. We already have plenty of information, more than enough. Uh, but rather to try and make sense of what I'm seeing largely um, it with my own eyes. Um, and I've been reflecting on this uh, this morning. It's brought me to a point of wondering just what is real and what is not, what we can trust and what we cannot trust. My main interest, although not my only one, is what's happening in the Arctic. In the past year or so, I've developed, uh, with some help, some small skills at looking at the data, looking at, um, at the things from Copernicus, from the Snow and Ice Center, from NASA Worldview, from the uh, US Navy sites, and I've limited myself to uh, a relatively small um, number of uh, data um, where I can kind of find I can interpret it. And I've developed some small skills in looking at the data and have come to see how reality often departs from what the data seems to be telling us. But just think about it for a moment. Even seemingly objective data that we use every day can seem to contradict each other. Every set of data is reanalyzed in some way, or it goes through a model, right down to the weather forecasts. So just think about uh, when we're trying to forecast what a cyclone like Dorian is likely to do. We have American models, and we have the European models, and often they contradict each other. So we just have to wait and see what uh, transpires. When we look at the sea ice thickness, we have the US Navy model, and we have a uh, US, sorry, an EU-based model. I can't quite remember its name at the moment because I don't really normally use it. And what they say is often quite, uh, quite, quite different. So, uh, truth be known. Uh, truth be told, I'm surprised that they can even measure ice thickness from satellite at all. Uh, my inclination would be to trust the old-fashioned method uh, used by Professor Peter Wadhams and others of estimating the thickness using sonar and, 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 and submarine. This is one of the clearest examples I've seen of uh, muzzling um, of, a, of a scientist in New Zealand. Um, so in 2016, Chris Brandolino, uh, who's a forecaster from Niwa, went on uh, television with Paul Henry and uh, he was given kind of pretty much open opportunity to uh, explain himself. And I think that Paul Henry, who had previously interviewed Guy McPherson, actually got it. So let's just briefly. Good morning, Paul. Is this a crisis? You know, I looked up the definition of emergency yeah. on the way in here in the cab yeah. and a situation that requires immediate action. So I think, yeah, it is. How significant is this 1.35 degree increase? It's huge because you're talking the whole globe. You're not talking one mm -hmm. station or one country or one area. It's the whole globe. And it, when you look at uh, where, how, how quickly, I mean, this beat the record set the month before in January. Okay. Here, here's the worry. Okay, so that's that. He's pretty enthusiastic there, and yet uh, just 
I don't know, a week later, he appeared on Radio New Zealand on exactly the same subject, and just uh, listen to how it went. I'm sorry, the audio is not so good on this one. The people looking at their gardens at this time of year will be going, well, look, is this is this global warming? Is, is, is it a factor? Yeah, well, look, um, it, you know, it's tough to say how much is global warming. Here at NIWA, we are taking part in some keyword emerging research, which we try to quantify um, how much of an, of an event, let's say, say a drought or a heat wave or a, a prolonged significant weather event, let's say, how much of that was actually, um, how much of that was a man-made component. But that doesn't happen as it's happening, and it certainly doesn't happen a month or two or a week. It takes many months, if not years, of research to go through the data and say, right, how much of this would have happened because of nature and how much is, is this because of man? Um, but um, So uh, having said that, um, the uh, NZCCC, the New Zealand Center for Climate Change, uh, we, we go to check it out, and he was a part of that. And uh, over the next years and decades, one of the things we're expecting is for a warmer Earth. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, an increase in global temperatures across the, the world, not just New Zealand. So that fits that mold in some ways. But, you know, is, it, is, it, is this warm weather completely because of uh, global change, or is it uh, just a small part of it? It's tough. Okay, so there we are. So here goes an example, a very recent example, uh, relating to the Amazon rainforest where um, people give totally different uh, ideas on things. And this article uh, seems to suggest that uh, even if we turn the whole uh, if we chop down the whole of the Amazon, all the boreal forests and uh, uh, all, the, all, all the forests in Indonesia, and we turned it all into concrete, we still wouldn't have a problem. Uh, even though plant photosynthesis is ultimately responsible for breathable oxygen, only a vanishingly tiny fraction of that plant growth actually adds uh, to the store of oxygen in the air. Even if all organic matter on Earth were burned at once, then less than 1% of the world's oxygen would be confused. Now, compare that with this, uh, this actual uh, scientific paper. The Human Physiological Impact of Global Deoxygenation. Um, and it says there's been a clear decline in the volume of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere over the past 20 years, even though the magnitude of this decrease appears small compared to the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. It is difficult to predict how this process may evolve due to the brevity of the collected records. A recently proposed model predicts a non-linear decay which will result in an increasingly rapid fall off in atmospheric oxygen concentration with potentially devastating consequences for uh, human health and so forth. Uh, well, those are two different uh, competing narratives, are they not? Uh, who are you going to believe? Um, I will just uh, now go to what um, Dane Wigington from uh, climateengineeringwatch.com has to say about this. From that report, Brazil's reversal on protecting the Amazon does not meaningfully threaten atmospheric oxygen. Even if all organic matter on Earth were burned at once, less than 1% of the world's oxygen would be consumed. There's enough of it to last for millions of years. What does that headline leave you thinking? It leaves you thinking that we can't harm the planet. We can do whatever we want to the planet. Don't worry. Everything will be fine for millions of years. What a blatant, glaring lie. We are likely on the current course far less than a decade away from human extinction, potential human extinction on this planet. And we get a headline like that from PBS. And for those who don't know, PBS is nothing more than a corporate controlled disinformation source. Consider this 2014 headline titled, The Corporate Dictatorship of PBS and NPR. Here's an excerpt from that report. Public broadcasting institutions now rely more and more on corporate and billionaire cash to operate, which is why PBS and NPR now filter what they play on their airwaves so that they don't anger their wealthy backers. What a surprise. With that report in mind, should we trust PBS's assurance that we should not worry about declining atmospheric oxygen content? Short answer, no. Consider this peer-reviewed science study headline from 2017, 
published in the Journal of Physiological Sciences. Here's the headline, quote, The Human Physiological Impact of Global Deoxygenation. Feel a little tired lately? It's not just all the particulates you're breathing, fallout from climate engineering operations and pollution, but also, again, the oxygen in our air column is declining. From the report, human dominion over planet Earth is driving profound changes that may culminate in our extinction. Loss of natural vegetation and the burning of fossil fuels are altering our atmosphere at an alarming rate. There's been I think that's another example. Um, just the other day, uh, my attention was pointed towards this. Um, and this is from Copernicus, the EU, and it's showing very, very kind of low levels of uh, ozone in the atmosphere um, and uh, yeah this this is uh, this is their own data and then uh, just two days later huh, I wonder if they saw my video so is that too uh, arrogant of me uh, this is uh, what the same people Copernicus are putting up. How unusual is this year's Antarctic ozone poll? The, ch the chart below shows the hole is forecast, forecast to be the smallest one in the Copernicus monitoring service, blah blah blah. And uh, here they are. They, uh, uh, they show the data. Uh, but that contradicts their own daily data. So let's just kind of have a look. This is uh, just the current data. So I'm sure you get the picture. Uh, there's a pretty low levels of, um, of, of ozone in uh, the the start of the spring period when it is traditionally low. Now, wrapping all of this up, all of this comes down to evidence and how we interpret it. Certainly when I was young and growing up, science was a completely different beast. People like my uh, late uncle uh, could have their own hypotheses about things and test them in a laboratory in their garage and they weren't accused of being anti-scientific or even of confirmation bias. Now science is completely different. Science has been corporatized and everyone who's tr trained scientists uh, their first concern is getting funding uh, and maintaining their own uh, livelihood. I've lost count of how many good scientists in this country, specialists, have been made redundant, have lost their jobs because various governments no longer have any interest in funding real science because that would mean being objective and accepting certain unpalatable conclusions that are presented to them um, through the scientific method. So science, meaning the scientific method, has become science with a big S, an accepted, officially mandated and top-down set of conclusions based on consensus, meaning the corporate interests of the global elite. So the people that say it's become the new religion are, well, they have some truth on their sides. Um, alternative views or dissident views have always been stomped on, but never, never anything like today when it has become so essential to hear them and when the future of humanity as a species is on a knife edge. I don't have the answers, but I have lots and lots of questions at a time 
when it has become or is becoming increasingly dangerous to do so. So for now, uh, to um, uh, even question the uh, any uh, official narrative about something uh, invites ridicule, contempt, and now it's gone over to censorship. So how long is it before it goes beyond that? So there's lots of evidence that show that um, that data, ev scientific evidence, is being used to distort rather than to try and get at the truth. It's being used to paint a full false picture. So how long before things get so bad that the data we depend on will no longer be available? How long before it all just goes dark and the people who insist on the truth uh, are no longer free and perhaps even picked up off the, off the street? So it doesn't really uh, bear thinking about, but some of us do think about it and some of us feel the pressure and we can't help contemplating this sort of turn of events perhaps in the not so distant future if things uh, become anywhere near as bad as what we think they are. So I have many thoughts and directions in which I could take all of this. Um, I could talk for instance about the spiritual battle that is in play. If you've not got your spiritual house in order, uh, I would say that you're looking at very, very uh, dark times. And even more so if you're in denial about all of this, it's you're going to come to a very, very rude awakening, perhaps when you can't put food on the table or the water doesn't come out of the taps or um, you go along to the bank and there's no money to be had. There's a, there's a bank run. Um, yeah, whatever. Very dark times. So I'll leave it there for now. Uh, this is uh, Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under.